Well, we've documented the making of one flute in ivory, and I haven't used ivory for many years. I used it in the, in the old days. I mean, there's, there's plenty of ivory, but sadly these days there's not much land for elephants, and so there's uh, next to nothing made in ivory. I had these billets for a long time and promised to make this flute for many years and decided to do it and document it because it's going into a special collection that will be held uh, up into the future and I thought it would be worth having one ivory flute that was not an original from the 18th century but one made in the, in the millennium, we'll call it the millennium flute, so that people could play it exhaustively and determine for themselves whether in fact ivory was indeed a worthwhile material significantly different in its playing properties from wood. Personally I have my doubts. I think shape, shape, shape are the three parameters that make for a good flute. Everything affects everything and wall, wall material will have it will have an effect upon the playing properties, but a much tinier effect, I believe, than the player imagines it to be. So we've made this that will go into a store of my flutes and it'll be there for people to play to exhaustion without harming the originals that are in the museums. This picture shows the original ivory dinner flute. It's now in the Nuremberg Museum. It has a C foot joint and a D foot joint. Here are the billets that I will start to work upon to model this flute, this original flute, by making it at a slightly lower pitch A392. The first operation as we cut the ivory is to turn it, rough turn it on the outside and then bore the interior with a pilot hole of about half an inch. You see me doing this with the gun drills and I'm lubricating them with a little water and soap to prevent the ivory from sticking to the tools and to keep the heat down. Then next we see the reaming operation where I use steel reamers to ream in this case the D foot joint to get the interior correct. We always do the interior and then from that do the exterior. Now mounted between two cones you see the D-foot joint being rough turned on the outside to block it out. Always constantly referring to the, the drawings. And in this case I'm going to fabricate the C-foot joint from several pieces of ivory. Glued together but in the final result we won't know that it's not one piece. Back onto the lathe now to rough turn and block it out. Here we're using the lathe in its uh, engine turning um, mode where we can easily turn cylinders for roughing it out. Now back onto a second lathe, we bore out the sockets and face the end. This is called the facing operation. And now we bore into the interior of the billet here to um, prepare the socket for final finishing. Close attention now to um, the final cuts and measuring with the vernier. And now a little bit of sanding to finish the interior of the socket to a smooth condition. It almost has a slight taper of about a um, quarter of a millimeter to allow the thread tenon to easily separate when you need to. Noting the socket size, we'll now work on what will become the top tenon of the middle joint. 
Now we're looking at a very rough and ready result here of very heavy flute indeed, but these are the pieces that we will be working on, making the outside more sophisticated, more true to the original. We're going to do the interior of the head joint with this expanding reamer. Again, we'll use water and soap to make sure that, that the reamer cuts well, it keeps cool, the ivory keeps cool, and no sticking occurs between the ivory and the reamer, taking just a very, very little amount off each time. When the interior is roughed out, we can then put it between two cones on the lathe, and we'll now start into the traditional hand turning, which is what I always use to form the outside of the flute, making reference to my measurements and to my drawings and pictures and using my own style of uh, small hand tools here with which is what has co is called negative rake. These tools are specially designed so that they don't get sucked into the workpiece and create any damage but as you can see they cut very sweetly with a nice chip and I make these tools from old planar blades from high speed steel. This type of turning has been used for thousands of years by craftspeople. The lathe is probably the most simple and oldest machine tool, if you will. In the old days, driven by the springed branch of a tree overhead or by a treadle. In this case, nothing much has changed except for using an electric motor to turn the spindle. Very little material is being removed, so the accent is upon crisp results and careful reference to your design work. So we're rough turning the outside and then we'll put the whole flute together from time to time, check the look of it and see if the form is coming together. It's very rough and heavy at this time, but um, I like to assemble it and keep an eye on the overall look. Now we'll do some more work now, gradually getting more form into the lower C foot joint, which has got three large bosses. Take the various keys. form is further developed, beginning to look something like what we see in the original. Remember I'm making this flute at a lower pitch, instead of 415 I'm making it at 392, so I'm somewhat stretching the whole acoustical design. Checking up to see that everything is in order with the assembled flute and seeing which is the next part to bring down to size.
little bit of sanding work here. We're seeing the rough sanding stage and it would be followed with several stages of fine sanding. But always we want to make sure that our, that our turning is as crisp as possible because any kind of over sanding of course would decrease the quality of the results, making it not quite as crisp and precise. So we want to get as much form off of the tool so that we only have to do just a very, very little final sanding. Now the tone holes, they are laid out and little pinpricks are made, keeping the, the line of the tone holes very precise. And as you see, the key layout will take the form that I'm sketching in here. This is a slightly stretched edition. Now we start into the keywork silver plate here and we're soldering on a boss. Dip it into the pickle to take off the flux, clean the edge before we do some shaping. Of course all the keywork can be done very nicely by hand but with saws and files and I've done many hundreds of keys that way but I thought you might be interested in some of these other techniques. Those people who are only used to doing hand techniques might study some of these other techniques and that's why we're showing them just now in this demonstration to give you some ideas of other ways of shaping your metal work. As I say, a file and a hacksaw will do a very good job but these are some other techniques that could be quite useful and might speed up your roughing work. Everything is finished by hand, but these add a little precision to the roughing work. Again, instead of filing, we can look at this alternative way of um, doing some shaping with the sanding disc at the roughing stage and then back to our traditional files. I use a combination of all of these techniques, but we want to concentrate on showing you one or two um, different ideas and forming. The D foot and the C foot will both have similar E flat keys, so we'll make two of those that are identical. A little tool here in this small milling machine is called an end mill. It's used for making flat surfaces. With the right hand down here, then I still kept this nice looking fishtail. This is called the vernier height gauge and it's quite useful in laying out. I'm using a Scottish penny here as a little guide because it happens to be about almost the same diameter as what I need for portion of the key. So we glue that little penny on there for um, a guide and then we can shape around the penny to get our silver close to the mark. There's another little technique you might take note of using a small um, electrical handpiece with various cutters in there. Bear in mind you can do a lot of damage with machine tools and it's always a good idea to have your skills honed with hand techniques with the file and the saw and burnishers. Master these hand techniques before you go any further. Again back to the milling machine. And now we'll put uh, the heavy silver boss behind that sheet of silver. And uh, cut that down to the required width. Here's a little setup that we use to pre precision drill the cross hole for the hinge portion. This little piece of metal helps to start the hole. 
either you see uh, it will clog up to the tool so we go in with plenty of uh, wax lubricant there and we go forward in small stages cleaning the chips out as we go. Now, when the cross hole is in there, we want to cut the slot exactly uh, central to that slot. So we use the vernier to get some scratch marks that will be completely central to the cross hole. Back onto the milling machine with a smaller end mill, we will do the flat and do the slot. Having done that, we can put the drill back through the already drilled hole to let it spot into the boss of the key, giving us the right position to complete the hinge pin on the key. There we are. Now we have a sense of how the mechanism works. Now onto the tone holes. You see the technique, they are better drilled on the lathe than on the milling machine using a wooden V-block. And the particular drill that's used here has uh, got um, an, an interesting point there that allows it to very accurately take up the centre position. The keys in this dinner flute have got a little ornamental heart shape on them that I want to incorporate. And since there'll be a hole in the key here, we don't want to look through and see the spring through that hole, so we'll make some special springs that um, allow the eye to go through that heart shape hole in the key without seeing the springs. Again, I'm demonstrating a number of different techniques from doing your silver work. The file is fine, works beautifully but it might be interesting for you to try some of these other techniques of removing the roughing material. Protected silver work here by making sure the jaws of the vise have got a soft covering, in this case a little masking tape will work fine to prevent the soft silver from being harmed by the steel jaws of the vise. A ball-ended vise here you see is very useful, it can be put in any position and I want to do some finishing work. Now we're working on this, the long C natural key here, made from a little bit heavier silver to get more strength for its long reach. We want to make sure that these silver keys are set up with the right angles and the right curves so that they are easily reached by the average player's finger there. They can go from one key to the other with facility. Here we're making the tiny silver ball-ended joint that will go on the long C key. This will become later clear to you. I prefer to make this separately. Glue the whole assembly together to make sure the mechanism is working sweetly before I finally solder the ball-ended joint onto the end of the long C key. Now, cutting out, roughing out the heart-shaped hole in both keys. Finishing is always done by hand. A little bit of rough shaping of the surface before we do some hand finishing and polishing. Making sure all surfaces are crisp. Some silver makers prefer to burnish the surfaces in the final operation. A good traditional technique. Here we see this little snake's tongue spring that allows me to spring the key without having to look through the nice little heart-shaped hole onto the spring. And 
that little serpent's tongue. Spring is lodged in in this manner. Here's the ball and socket joint for the C foot. And now both keys for the E flat are coming along well. Begin to see their final form. Here's the, all of the silver work in the springs. Now what I'm doing is I'm making an experimental head joint from wood because I want to test the playing purposes and the pitch and make sure that everything's functioning acoustically. When I get that right, I will copy those acoustical results into the solid ivory head joint. Checking here with all of my reaming to make sure that my bores are the way I want them. I'm measuring diameter against length and graphing that out and keeping an eye on uh, the internal acoustics, the most important part of the whole flute. As I like to say, shape, shape, shape are the three most important parameters. Testing the tuning, the voicing, the speaking, seeing if we're at the pitch, the desired pitch. Now working on this uh, huge tone hole that covers uh, the, the C key covers. Gently working that with a ball ended burr here. Again, it can be worked perfectly well with scrapers, files. This is just another technique for you to study. Of course you can do great damage using these techniques and so uh, you have to be very, very confident with your hand tools if they are power driven. How is the pitch doing now? How is the intonation, the voicing? Here we're undercutting the tone holes that can be done again with files and scrapers and here I'm demonstrating doing them with a burr. working late into the night here in my Scottish workshop. Doing some final tuning and finishing of the undercutting of the tone holes with a file. And then again with this little triangular crisp edge scraper. And then the most important tools in finishing the whole flute, including the voicing. Now we've got the uh, ivory head joint playing, trying to model the results that I'd found satisfactory in the wooden head joint. In the final work on the voicing, this uh, triangular scraper, blunt edged but crisp edged, but blunt angled, so that it doesn't dig in, but it will cut sweetly. Sometimes a little bit of work with a needle file helps. And we want to know what, we're, what shape we're making in there, so from time to time I have to take a little moulding in plasticine or silly putty or children's modelling wax. In Scotland it's called plasticine on the end of a piece of wood. Very powerful technique. We introduced that um, modelling wax into the bore and press up into the mouth hole and it will give us an impression of the shape that we're working on. There it is and then I can take some measurements and see what's happening there and what I want to continue to adjust. What we think we're doing and what we're actually doing on internal holes are two different things so it's always good to take 
a modeling wax impression of the torn hole. It's just a piece of soft plasticine and we can take an impression of it in a few seconds. It's not a hardening wax. How are things doing now? Beginning to sound like an instrument and not like a fancy candlestick. But more adjustments are necessary. At this stage of the making, I am working every aspect of the flute. My approach is to get the flute playing and tell and try and tell me in the, in the way it's behaving what's missing. What's the most important thing that's missing for me that I need to attend to? That might be a little bit more reaming, the opening up of the tone holes, the undercutting, the voicing, the external diameters. These are little uh, tapered dreamers that can slightly open the tone holes by a few thousandths of an inch at a time. They're polished on the end so they do no damage to the bore. Similarly with the mouth hole, with a little tapered dreamer, you can take a very tiny increase in the mouth hole diameter. Now I'm going to do some uh, final finishing of the ivory head joint and see how it compares. I'm always interested in the weight of a flute. If it's an ivory, it's heavier than wood. If the ivory flute is too heavy, it won't feel comfortable to play. So ivory flutes in general are thinner than wood flutes, and that's to keep the weight down. Now the head joint I know is too long, and now that I've got my mouth hole in there, I'm going to bring the length of the top end of the head joint to its proper length. And so we'll mark that out and cut a chunk of it off in the bandsaw. A little pause here to uh, have a word with the joiners and carpenters who are working on my gate and my fence. Take a little break in the Scottish sunshine out there in my little Fishertown home in the highlands of Scotland. Now we're going to make um, a rough piece cut out in ivory to make the end cap of uh, this model of the Denner flute. Here the lathe and its mechanical uh, setup is uh, fast to rough the piece down. See how it fits in there, all of the pieces fitting together in the flute has got, have got to be loose and the tightness is set by wrapping with silk because as the flute expands and contracts we don't want the socket and tenon to get overstressed causing a crack in the socket so there's always this intermediate winding of thread that takes up the gap and we use that so that the player can adjust the tightness or looseness of the joints but we don't want the wood or ivory pieces to be touching as that would cause high stress forever making some more smaller and smaller adjustments now we have to make some pins with some little ball ends on the pins so that we can pull the pins out because these holes are in the seafood joint are blind so the little ball ends are made by melting the silver wire which with surface tension forms a tiny molten sphere then we let that cool and polish it finally having set the pitch I'm going to hand turn little depression with some grooves to take the upper windings of the middle joint.
a little antique spool uh, holder here helps to hold my wax silk thread in my Scottish workshop which as you see is very small because it's in a little cottage in the Highlands, not much space but it has the, the necessary tools. Another little technique here using um, the high speed burrs that uh, dentists sometimes use. It's, it's, if your hands are skilled it can be useful in forming some of the finishing touches of the silver before we go over it with a file. Everything's working mechanically and now we're concentrating on the final cosmetics and the look of the keys. Final work by hand. The surface looks flat but when you draw a file it you can see that it's not really flat. You see the high points there being taken down to get a sweet surface on the keys. First with the file and then with other finishing techniques. These could be oil and sandpaper, some steel wool or you know, some silver workers prefer to use the burnisher as the final operation here. We're still roughing, seeing how the shape is. Now we're doing a little somewhat dangerous operation here and we're cutting down the boss of the C key so that it matches the ivory boss. Chipping away at the silver, taking it down to match the ivory as a roughing operation before we finally finish it by hand. Now again with the hand work, a little bit more lathe work. We're doing some little circular grooves there. And then one of the last operations is to put the maker's name stamp on there. The name stamp in steel is wiped or held over a lit candle to get lamp black carbon on it. And that will give color to the name stamp. So it's rolled in, as you see here, make, making sure that the name stamp is properly lined up. And a fair amount of pressure is exerted against the flute part, supported with a steel mandrel inside. And very carefully, in each piece of the flute, as is traditional, the maker's name goes on. And here we have the final result. Okay. So this is an interpretation of the Nuremberg original Denner flute, which currently plays at A415, but which showed signs of having extenders that are now missing, taking it to a lower pitch. So this is an experimental flute at low pitch 392.